whenever I write a paper, I put it on what we call the archive, which is a repository, worldwide repository, of all the scientific papers in my field. And I must say, I'm always very anxious the moment I do that, because the moment I put my paper there, I know the next day, thousands of people will read it, and uh, that particular day I will get my feedback. Uh, either they like it or they do not like it. And of course, the worst thing that can happen is no reaction. But uh, it's truly global. And uh, the amazing thing is if you do that, that you sometimes hear, well, we really enjoyed your paper. And this afternoon we organized a little seminar about it, say, in Japan or in Russia or in the United States. And so I think that really tells me how important it is that we uh, share that information openly and, and as, as soon and, uh, as possible. So for you, it is also talking about efficiency. For this is the best way to get in touch with those who could be of interest for you. Exactly. I think it's yeah. uh, both in terms of quality, mm -hmm. in the sense I get immediate feedback of the best people who can uh, criticize if necessary. But it's also about uh, getting the next generation involved because uh, students can uh, see what I've been interested in. They can, so to say, know exactly what my latest research is and they can join. And perhaps they can also criticize because often it's the younger generation who is, uh, has the, the best eye to see uh, an improvement. And I think this immediate feedback uh, it both makes you a little bit nervous as a scientist yeah. because uh, issue ideas are issue results up to the standard that you demand, but also it's very stimulating because you're immediately engaged with the total scientific community. I have a nice story for you. That was when I just took over this portfolio, the digital agenda, and I was invited <coughs> to join <coughs> for a campus party in Madrid. And it was a combined effort from the Spanish presidency mm -hmm. at that time and uh, the European Commission. And uh, we had invited, uh, or it was a beauty contest for inventors, startups and what have you. And there were thousands of the youngsters. The youngest was 14 and the eldest 29. They were all camping um, in uh, the hall, but also gathering their ideas and inventions, and a lot all connected with the digital uh, sector. And at a certain moment, I was joining a couple of those kids, and uh, they were showing each other on their screen what was at stake in their invention. And I said to one of them, you are, you are stupid, you are just joining your invention with your potential competitor yeah. and he looked at me and he said madam you are old-fashioned for that <laughs> sharing and joining is indeed much more stimulating I got a better result out of that exactly. that was the best lesson for me talking about uh, well, I think that's also a deep lesson yeah. about how uh, progress in, in science and, and, and academic world works that you it's a strange mixture of competition mm -hmm. and collaboration and even if your competitor uh, is the, has an earlier result and is some kind of beaten by it, and then often you feel, well, wait a moment, I'm very close by, so perhaps yeah. uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's a dialogue, mm. and I can, so to say, make the next yeah. move. Yeah. In, in that sense, it's more yeah. like, perhaps like a tennis game where you try to kind of uh, strike the ball as many times as possible. What can we do better in explaining open access for how you are doing it yes. in the Netherlands? And um, thanks to you, a lot of youngsters are now more involved in what is at stake in science. And yes. Well, I think the, uh, there is here an important basic principle, that is that by nature, uh, science is a public enterprise. It's something that we do for the public good. We use the public resources, we use the public talent, people who are there. And, uh, and it always been an advantage for, for science to, and to use the modern technology, whether it's books or, or, or uh, the internet, to engage as many people as possible. And in fact, one should realize that, that in some sense you are fortunate enough to actually be involved in research because the public support this. Yeah. And so I think we should give back and we should uh, uh, sometimes, some of the public can actually join your effort, but I think it's mo much more important, it's building support, respect, for uh, this, uh, what I often call like the silent force in history, which has been technology, scientific research, that of course clearly uh, enhanced our lives in, in remarkable ways. Mm -hmm. 
And, but we are not aware of that, but we can only be uh, supporting that effort if people are uh, aware what we are doing. So I feel that uh, from the point of view of a working scientist, it's my duty to communicate to as many people as possible what I'm doing, what my big questions are, what motivates me, and uh, how I can actually help society. Are you unique in your attitude compared to your colleagues? Well, I think that uh, we see a change of attitude among scientists. Uh, I think the, uh, the younger generation in particular, they, um, they're much more grown up with this idea of sharing. They uh, feel that that's actually, to a large extent, the way in which science should work. I think it's also a little bit the internal dynamics of the scientific enterprise in the sense that the big questions that we are now able to address uh, could range from uh, studying the climate or our human health or even the, the, the history and the future of the universe. It's places where various disciplines are coming together. So sharing is uh, also for a very practical reason the future. Mm -hmm. And so I see that the younger generations in particular, they, um, they also are interested in this and they are in some sense mm -hmm. able to combine yeah. their own research with reaching out and communicating uh, and in fact also uh, their community service and it become in that sense much more all-round uh, scientists I think. We know each other a bit longer yes. so I, I would dare to say let's just say Robert and Nady. Having uh, put that at the table, Robert, um, are we in a hurry for what is pushing you? I think we are in a hurry uh, because it's, uh, we are at a very crucial moment of time, I think, mm. uh, because uh, clearly technology is developing. Um, we have enormous uh, challenges that mm. also uh, as scientists we are, are uh, confronted with. And the, we have essentially global problems, so we need to find global solutions. And I think Europe is a very special situation here because in some sense we are not only the continent that invented the modern scientific method. We did this actually in a very uh, direct dialogue. Now, if you go back to the 16th, 17th century, you wouldn't have the discussion because in some sense, uh, science was open access and people were yeah, traveling sure. and universities were places where students from the whole continent would come. So we are almost like reinventing our past uh, with modern technology. Uh, but uh, in some sense, it's quite a uh, challenging time too, because you now the, the, the nature of the challenges that we are confronted with, and we just have to hope that our ideas and our talent and technology is able to overcome that. And we need here, I guess, some kind of direction of the future. And uh, how are we in this world going to work together? And I think Europe is in a unique position to show how this can be done in practice how we can actually come together. Sometimes we do it around a big facility, whether it's a particle accelerator, a biology lab, or a telescope. Mm. But I think in some sense that's even much too concrete. Uh, the, the digital world is in some sense a much more fluid place to come together. And I think here the world mm. is looking for some kind of leadership and I hope that Europe will take that uh, under your guidance. What should Europe, and talking about the European Commission and Parliament and uh, the councils, what should we do, do in a different way to push it? Is there a secret formula for that? <laughs> I'm, I'm well, I think uh, we are in a time of uh, rapid change and people mm -hmm. are looking uh, what is the direction we are going. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's sometimes very difficult to make a decision uh, from a national point of view, because certainly in Europe you will often argue my country is too small to kind of set an example uh, and because uh, things are out of my control. Europe, certainly in the scientific world, is uh, by far, I would say, the, the largest block. It's, uh, it's actually uh, it's the growth both in output and quality of, say, in the last 10, 20 years has been remarkable and I think Europe can uh, also address this issue that there is a kind of added value, mm -hmm. enhanced quality by working with these kind of various different cultures. Because in some sense we think about the geographical borders which should be removed, but I think also the disciplinary borders and I would say also generational borders working across generations and even very deep generations use our history, the resources, 
the data that are there, in, in, even in the past, we all should come together. And I think th uh, this is again an issue that the whole world is looking for some kind of leadership, but I think Europe could do this. And so what I think what the European Commission could do, what you could do, and you're already doing this, uh, basically pointing out to everyone what the direction is of future developments. Because in some sense, I think certainly from this kind of larger perspective, it's kind of clear how we are moving. It will be a more open world. Uh, we, uh, as scientists, we will have to adapt and in fact have to embrace, I think, uh, and, and, and again, it's in our genes, mm -hmm. that this is, is a public enterprise. We have to realize this. And that means that apart from all the nuances and the small decisions that you want to make, and of course, in some sense, you have an ecosystem that's changing. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as with climate change, you don't want it to be too rapidly mm -hmm. that you know, all kind of things go extinct. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, it's clear in which direction we are going. And I think by just articulating this, as you do, it, uh, it helps to orient people, uh, basically will be a compass to say, well, this is the direction we are going. That means that in the future, everything we do should be towards a more open approach to the scientific endeavors. And uh, so I hope in five years we have, uh, first of all, I think we have some consensus that this is the way to go forward, that we have uh, practically uh, a many business models in the scientific publishing that are open access that we have much more open uh, sources, both of data and, and, and software. But I think also very important that, for instance, education, we haven't talked about that, yeah. but educational resources yeah. should uh, also be open. And I think, again, this development is rapidly. Uh, yeah. Even just, let's say, this spring, we had many events that uh, signi uh, signal that we are changing to, so to say, a, a new regime, a more open regime. Yeah. And uh, so I think uh, it's quite realistic to hope that in five years we are, uh, say, in the beginning of a new period. And of course, there are still uh, many practical issues that have to be solved, but that uh, in some sense we have made this change and we're now firmly on a uh, direction of uh, an open science model. You were touching upon uh, CERN, um, yes. a, a main position worldwide of a European project, yes. so to say. Really By European way, success story, uh, I would say. Yeah. Yes. What could be another European success story? Ah, uh, well, you see that, uh, why did CERN work? Because it was clearly a common goal. So, um, but in some sense, I would say it's almost old fashioned because it's a, a big uh, machine uh, that's very expensive and we all share the machine. So I think uh, in some sense, the next step to be uh, thinking much more in terms of information that we are sharing in a common project. And uh, so I think what will be in line much more is perhaps not the physical sciences, but uh, the humanities yeah. Yeah. and the way uh, we are uh, basically mm -hmm. sharing uh, our history, mm -hmm. our, uh, our literature, our art, uh, which has many more layers of significance. Right? So it's in some sense, uh, I don't think we want to build one big library or something. That's that 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 we did say uh, many many years ago mm. in Alexandria. Mm. Say uh, now we want to do this mm. in the digital world. So I think it's really the next step, where in some sense the uh, I would say almost the physical presence uh, is uh, well transformed into a much more a digital presence. So I think in that role, confronting mm. the huge data that are there in, in the humanities and in the social sciences, I think that could be really a, a flagship project for Europe. We will be um, in, in close uh, contact with you and I wish you a lot of success in your new appointment, but you will be back to Europe one day, I'm certain. I but will. we can certainly be online and find out what uh, could be done for Europe and the future of open access of all those scientific and marvelous uh, facts and figures. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I really hope that uh, you can keep on this kind of leadership role in this, this such an important issue, which I think uh, is important for Europe, but definitely also important for the rest of the world. Thank you.